Good uh, afternoon. My name is Marcos. I'm the founder, publisher, Daily Coast. Anybody see Bill O'Reilly last night? Any chance? He's the most popular show on cable. Nobody here saw it. <sighs> I didn't either. <laughs> but thanks to the wonders of YouTube, I found out that yesterday he said I was no different than the KKK. There was no more hateful group than the Daily Coast group. And uh, uh, Al Gore just spoke at our uh, sort of our national conference last, uh, last week, and so he'd lost, respect in the, he'd lost all respect for Al Gore. Because <laughs> we knew that Bill O'Reilly was in Al Gore's corner the entire time. And, uh, but it was, it was sort of instructive because it sort of shows that Daily Coast really is one of the most impactful organizations right now in the, in the uh, sort of progressive sphere. Uh, it drives Bill O'Reilly crazy and all his little clones and Sean Hannity's and, uh, and uh, Carl Groves went on, on a rant against uh, the work we're doing at Daily Coast. And ultimately, uh, I, I would argue that Daily Coast is probably one of the most influential organizations in sort of driving the media narrative and trying to shape the direction that the broader traditional media covers information. And all of this is done on a budget of less than a million dollars a year, which um, I thought was a hell of a lot of money from where I, where I came, and apparently not so much. <laughs> now, I say all of this not because I, I want to brag about Daily Coast or, uh, or uh, its accomplishments. I, I think, you know, I believe very strongly that the organization and the work we do speak for themselves. But because I want to sort of talk about where I came from and how this organization started and, and make a broader point about sort of where we're going as a movement and the democratizing nature of, of, uh, of uh, technology. I, um, I was born in Chicago but grew up in El Salvador. I lived there till 1980 when the war forced my family to come back to the United States as essentially refugees, packed everything they owned into a station wagon, drove all the way through Guatemala, through Mexico, got into Texas. We still had all our stuff. First night in Texas, it was all stolen. <laughs> so my parents struggled for, for years, from 80 to 89. I, I graduated high school in 89. They struggled, but, but, they, but they were very much, un, unlike, unfortunately, many in my community, in the Latino community, they actually were very much focused on education. So they, they did what they could to make sure that we were always properly educated. Uh, I was a political junkie from an early age, and I, and I wanted subscriptions to both the Chicago Tribune and the Chicago Sometimes, and they, uh, they got both. And it wasn't until college where I realized that newspapers are expensive. So you, you sort of, when you grow up, you sort of start realizing the sacrifices your parents made. But they made a lot of sacrifices, but they couldn't really afford for me to go to college. They didn't need to. I joined the Army. I did my training in Oklahoma. Uh, served in Germany between 1989 and 1992 during the first Gulf War. And uh, came back, and thanks to the GI Bill, thanks to the state of Illinois, I was able to get my undergraduate education at a very average, nondescript state school ca called Northern Illinois University. Uh, I got two, major, uh, two degrees. I had three majors, majors in philosophy, political science, journalism. I had a minor in German, for good measure, in four years. Suck it. Four years. <laughs> I had a lot of, lot of, lot of uh, work. I was working full time at my school newspaper, and I was stringing for the Chicago Tribune. I thought I wanted to be a journalist. Uh, realized at the very, very last minute that I didn't want to be the person writing about the people doing stuff. I actually wanted to be one of the people doing stuff. I didn't know what that was going to be, though. So I needed three years to kill, and I couldn't think of a better way to do so than law school. <laughs> and uh, so I went to Boston University, where I spent three years, uh, essentially courting my soon-to-be wife. And uh, law school was sort of a, a secondary consideration. I was never a very good law student. <laughs> and uh, came out in 1999 to the Bay Area to make my dot-com millions. Now, if anybody here knows the area, 1999 was about three years too late. <laughs> so my timing was a little bit off. 
But I had all these, the, you know, I ended up at a, at a web development shop here in San Francisco. Uh, so I had this sort of mismatch of skills, you know, my legal, legal training, my journalism training, my international experience, and uh, no real direction for it to go. And, uh, and even a little bit of uh, a technology fetish. Uh, I'm, I'm very much, uh, I wanted to be a programmer, but it never was good at it. But I, I you know, I'm one of the few people who wanted to be a programmer. <laughs> And, and was angry that I couldn't be that person. I, I, was, I wanted to be a nerd. <laughs> and um, so 2002 rolls around. And, and this was a very difficult time to be a progressive. Some of you may remember. It, it, or you may have blocked it out. I mean, <laughs> 2002, we have the aftermath of the Afghanistan war, which had gone reasonably well, but it was a time of political uh, oppression. You, we were not allowed to criticize the president because <laughs> it would be showing disunity and uh, weakness to the enemy, and we needed to be united. And it didn't matter what the issue was. It wasn't about being united on the war in Iraq or uh, Afghanistan, but it was on domestic issues. And it was about this upcoming war with Iraq, which was suddenly starting to be fairly clear and obvious on the horizon. And as I looked out in the media landscape for voices that were sort of expressing what I was feeling, there were absolutely none, nothing. If they wanted to put an anti-war voice up there, they put in Janine Garofalo. And, you know, and I love Janine, but she'll be the first to say that they did that on purpose to marginalize anti-war voices, because the only people who would be opposed to this war would be Janine Garofalo, right? Comedians, <laughs> not serious people. And you had these so-called liberals in our punditry, people like Joe Klein and Richard Cohen, telling us with their little furrowed brows, you know, that serious people knew that Saddam Hussein's a threat. And a lot of us would look at the information and at the evidence, and we'd say, um, I, we think we're serious, but this does not add up. Well, that's because you're a commie. That's because you're a hippie. You're a, as we in the blog world like to call them, dirty fucking hippie. We were just dirty fucking hippies. And he had Tom Friedman, who of course was supposed to be another so-called liberal. He went on Charlie Rose and he said, well, maybe Iraq isn't have any, doesn't really have a direct connection to 9-11, but we need, to get, we need to show the Arabs, we need, to, we need them to see Americans kicking down their, no, their doors and shoving a rifle in their face and saying, suck on this. This was American foreign policy as dictated by so-called progressives in the media landscape. There was, no, there was no voice of reason. Luckily for us, at that moment, uh, technology had finally started to catch up uh, on this front, on the media front, and people like me could publish online for zero, or I bought my own domain name, so I spent eight ninety five. <laughs> that was my investment, and I bought myself a printing press, and I could suddenly buy ink by the barrel for the cost of eight ninety five. And a lot of people did what I did, and what we found, and what I found obviously at Daily Coast, is that there was a huge market need for strong, unapologetic, progressive voices. And what we also found really quickly is that there was a wealth of incredible energy and talent outside of Washington, D.C., outside of New York City, outside of Los Angeles, that were able to argue, were able to build on new activism uh, campaigns, be innovative, and these weren't people who were in the traditional progressive movement. These weren't people who had access to the usual avenues to get funded, to, uh, to be heard. I mean, I didn't have any connections. I was, I was a project manager at a web development shop in San Francisco. My parents certainly didn't have any connections, and so nobody would know who they were. I didn't have money to buy my way in. But thanks to technology, all I needed was at 8.95. And a little bit of time. And then that became a lot of time. And that became all my time. <laughs> and then my wife started having problems with it. <laughs> <laughs> so 
so that's where it costs. That's the, the, the price I was, had to pay. But as we've grown as a movement, and we have since those days in 2002 when I started Daily Coast, uh, that's never changed. That, that sort of realization that there are a lot of people, there are a lot of voices, and there are a lot of talents outside of not just the, the, uh, the media and uh, political mainstreams, but also the activism ones. People who, who maybe you've never heard of or you've never talked to, you don't know exist, that are doing incredible, incredible work. And as a medium, we've been successful because we have tapped into this energy from people who want to say in their politics, we're seeing this not just in politics even, of course, in music, MySpace type bands, the MySpace bands. You're seeing it in, in video, cinema with, with YouTube and technologies like that. We're seeing a true democratization of, of our culture. And that's also the case in activism. And so suddenly you have organizations that aren't on the radar, that aren't part of the old guard, that can actually have an impact that maybe uh, approach that of some of these established mainline organizations or can exceed them. Again, I mean, the budget of Daily Coast is, is less than, seven, than $1 million a year. And given the impact that it has had, um, I'm not asking for money, so don't, you don't need to give me money. Um, I'm saying that it's incredible what technology and a core group of people, talents that people, you know, that aren't necessarily uh, on the radar screen have been able to accomplish. And I think that's something that everybody needs to be able to tap to, tap into as you grow your organizations and as you start looking where to, uh, to um, move in the forward, how do you expand, who you hire, is to realize that there are people already doing these things and doing them for free and they're doing them very effectively and you can see them online, you can find them online. And I know that when I do my hiring now, I don't look at resumes anymore. I, I couldn't care about a resume, I need to know what they've done. And if they have done anything, it, there's a trail on it. There's a, there's a blog, there's video, there's, there's evidence of those accomplishments. I've taken this one step forward, now there's a Coast Fellowship Program, which uh, I'm working with Tides on, which is essentially providing micro grants to a lot of these activists to encourage them to keep doing this kind of work. It's a lot of times it's thankless work and not a lot of feedback. It's lonely. A lot of people in a lot of deep red states in Boise and up in Montana and in Alaska, uh, or deep in machine blue states, where if you're not plugged into the machine, like let's say in New, uh, Illinois or New Jersey, you're sort of out of the picture. These are lone, people are lonely, but we're trying to encourage these people by providing micro grants for specific projects. And if those work out, hopefully, uh, we hope to expand that to provide full on uh, full time fellowships to keep doing this kind of work because there is a wealth of talent out there. And for a movement that has really been predicated for too long on programs, I think there has to be a shift towards people. Daily Coast didn't get started as a program. It got started because I had an idea and obviously I tapped in to an existing need. Move On didn't get started as a program, but because people had an idea and they executed an idea and had Wes Boyd, and Joan Blades, or had I gone to funders five years ago, and had I said, had we said, or let's say 10 years ago, hey, we got this great idea, and we have perfect 2020 uh, vision, which we don't, but had we said, in 2008, this is what we're gonna be as organizations, this is the kind of impact we're gonna have on the politics, and in the future of our nation, and in the national debate, can you give us some money to get things started? They would've looked at me, they would've looked at Joan, and they would've looked at Wes, and they would've laughed at us laughed at us and we would have left with nothing. Luckily, we live in a world now where we can build first, prove the concept, and then execute. And I, I think uh, that's because people will arise from places you do not expect without the proper credentials. And instead of thinking, what program am I gonna fund? Really start thinking about what people I'm gonna look at and what people I'm going to fund, because that's what's going to build this movement, not programs, but people. Thank you very much.